Good evening, everyone. My name is Damon Phillips. I'm the co-director of the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise here at uh, Columbia Business School, uh, Columbia University. Um, and, and I'm also a professor who uh, teaches entrepreneurship here. Um, thank you for coming and then joining us for this webinar. Um, we're really excited for it. Um, in the Tamer Center, we engage in a lot of activities to help empower um, and to help train people, both current and future leaders to, uh, to, to help change the world, especially around social and environmental causes. And as you know, there are no shortage of those that we're all working on right now. Um, our particular interest for tonight, a lot of it's connected through our partnership with uh, the Center for Dress Justice and this uh, initiative that Aidan McDonald, who you will hear from in a bit, uh, really spearheaded here called Justice Through Code. Um, and it's, um, you know, I, I don't wanna uh, I'll let others explain it in more, more detail, but it's an important pro, uh, program for us. And I think a, um, it's part of a larger need, not, not just here, but everywhere for those of us in all sectors of society, including the business community, including within that, the, the tech sector, to really dig uh, deeper than we ever have before to engage in these problems. And uh, so I'm very excited about tonight. I'm really looking forward to, to the conversation that we're gonna have. Um, I have my notepad and I'm ready to take notes, um, to listen, and to learn. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Aiden. Thank you, Damon, for the introduction and for your and the Tamer Center for Social Enterprises support of Justice Through Code from the very beginning. <clears throat> for those of you that don't know me, I'm Aiden McDonald, the founder and program manager of Justice Through Code, a free semester-long coding and interpersonal skills intensive that provides life-changing access to career track technology jobs for the formerly incarcerated. <clears throat> Originally taught on Columbia's campus and now offered virtually for the fall semester, JTC works to tackle the crisis of mass incarceration by addressing two of the most significant predictors of recidivism, a lack of job training and the subsequently high rates of unemployment for the formerly incarcerated. The JTC curriculum focuses on teaching participants the fundamentals of programming in Python while equipping them with the requisite skills to embark on a sustainable career in the tech industry. Throughout the course, our students hear from industry leaders during our guest lecture series and also work with current Columbia MBA students to workshop resumes, cover letters, and LinkedIn profiles as they prepare to embark on their career journeys. Upon program completion, we provide students with post-graduation support as they continue their educational and career journeys through mentorship programs with Google and Slack employees, free courses through our educational partner, Coursera, and finally through connecting students to jobs and internships throughout the tech ecosystem. <clears throat> as someone who spent four years incarcerated in federal prison for my involvement in the marijuana distribution in my early 20s, I understand all too well the importance of programs like Justice Through Code. Over the last few months, as the country has experienced renewed calls to address systemic racism, I've been reminded of the reality that I came face to face with during my first days of incarceration, a system that disproportionately affects black and brown communities, and once entered into, makes it virtually impossible to get ahead in life. As a member of the one in 17 males in America, white males in America, who will be incarcerated in their lifetimes, I understand many of the challenges that others face when coming home. But my privilege as a white male also means that on the day I walked out of prison, I was far more likely to secure a job with a living wage. It is my hope that today and in this series of events, we can all explore ways that we can work to address systemic racism and mass incarceration in our work and daily lives. And now I'll proudly introduce you to a person that I have come to know over the past nine months as one of my closest friends, Justice Through Code program graduate, Antoine. Thank you, Eden, for the great introduction, and more importantly, for introducing such an important topic. You know, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, as of 2017, Blacks represent 12% of the U.S. adult uh, population, but make up 33% of the prison population, 
while whites account for 64% of the U.S. adult population, but 30% of prisoners. At the same time, there are 1,500 black prisoners per 100,000 black adults, while there are 272 white prisoners per 100,000 white adults. This indicates that blacks are six times more likely than whites to be incarcerated. While these numbers can be attributed to racial inequality and sentence disparities and other factors, they don't address the racial, any, racial disparity once the incarcerated individual returns to society and attempts to reestablish his or her life. As Aiden indicated, he knew as a formerly in incarcerated white male, he had a greater chance to become gainfully employed than a black person who had not been incarcerated and his odds would be greatly increased when compared to a formerly incarcerated black person. Personally, I spent an entire decade trying to reestablish my, like myself with a sustainable income and a marketable career. I went from one menial job to another trying to make ends meet because companies that would provide sustainable income simply would not hire me regardless of how impressive my education or my prior work experience looked on a resume. The Justice Through Code program has changed my life, not just by offering me coding skills, but because it offers an entire support system. The magnitude of having a program like Justice Through Code at Columbia University cannot be adequately, adequately expressed in words. Doors have opened for me that prior to attending and completing Justice Through Code were not even able to be seen. Justice Through Code has been, life change, has been a life-changing experience. I am currently working a temp assignment as a junior software engineer. In this assignment, if I was hired for this assignment for an entire year, the salary that I would be making would surpass the entire salary that I've made since returning home in 2009. Having a living wage and sustainable income and also being involved with the program involved in social consciousness is very important to me and I'm thankful to be a part of it. Thank you for allowing me to address this panel and our listening audience. I now turn over the reins to our moderator for this event, Lily Gangas, who is the CTCO at the KPOR Center. Lily? You're muted, Lily. Hey. Thank you so much for sharing um, the, the, the stories. I think it just raises the, the, the reason why we're here today, especially in this moment. And um, like many of you, technology also changed my life. And I think for me, that's why being in, uh, coming from a single parent home, being an immigrant, not even having uh, English as my first language, there were so many different barriers that as I got to learn, um, folks like me weren't supposed to also be in certain rooms. And so um, this is why the work that I do at the Caper Center is really my passion of purpose and skill. So I'm, thank you for the invitation to be here today. And before we jump right into the discussion, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge what's been happening this past week, the last 24 hours um, with Jacob Blake, specifically the, the, the shootings that took place and the protesters out in Kenosha. I just want to take a moment right now to just have a moment of silence to acknowledge that. Thank you, thank you for that moment. I know that folks are coming in from different uh, uh, places and not only their day, but their week, their time. So I just wanted to make sure that we're all recentered um, and ready for this dialogue that I think is really timely and important. And why? Because this is and has to be the turning moment in our history. The generations that are watching that are just even gathered in this virtual Zoom is really the folks who are here to make the change happen. And it has to be systemic. We're in the midst of a pandemic the largest social movement in history, in a, in a fight for our democracy. And so I would say that the stakes have never been greater for us to get together, share, but also take an action. And as we've all seen that technology has played a critical role for better or for worse, overnight we became a digital first world where millions of Americans have been disconnected from crucial information of how to get access to healthcare, education, and other basic needs, specifically what's been coined the digital divide or digital disconnection. Specifically with our kids, where we take a look at 13 to 15 million is estimated K through 12 students are currently um, impacted and 30% of those are disconnected are students of color. And so when we think about the power that the innovation economy can have, 
with the tech opportunities that can have, if we're not also creating um, opportunities and solutions for the students now, we're going to lose our future innovators, our future workforce. And, and as we get into the folks who are in the workplace already in tech, um, and, and many, as you were sh sharing earlier, Antoine, that first salary is so life-changing, right? And, but uh, right now, if we take a look at who is currently there, specifically people of color, it's about less than 10% of representation. And why this matters a lot is because if you just take a look at the four tech companies, they're valued at close to more than, close to $5 trillion. And when we take a look at the racial wealth gap that's being increasing, if we are not in those rooms as the, the creators, the developers, the designers, the marketers, we're being left behind even more. And for the folks who want to learn more about the systemic barriers that have been really well documented, but we need to get to the solutions. And we need to get to solutions at, at the large scale. I encourage you to also check out the Caper Center's Leaky Tech Pipeline report um, if you'd like to go more in depth. And as we move towards the entrepreneurship, where, where some of these solutions are being created, when we take a look at also the, the people of color, that get that are, are receiving funding from venture capitalists and other funders the number even gets smaller right but this is but we know that change is coming which is why today and tonight we are here with this amazing group set of of speakers of tech leaders and entrepreneurship leaders who have through their own journey have been tackling these issues for many years and for many decades and have really put their life's work at this and so it's my pleasure to introduce uh the following panel Phaedra Ellis Lampkins, co-founder and CEO of Promise, Anil Dash, CEO of Glitch, John Madsen, CTO of Goldman Sachs and trustee member of Vera Institute of Justice, and Marcus Bullock, CEO of Flickshop. Thank you all for being here virtually. I get to some familiar faces, but also some new faces, and it's my pleasure to be here with you all. So with that said, I would love to start and, and have you all share your story of your why. Why are you, what are some of the specific issues that you're tackling that are top of mind and why you started your organization and working where you, the solutions that you're currently in? Why don't we start with Phaedra first? Uh, I'm happy to start. Thank you, Lily. I feel like I really appreciated uh, one being here and hearing the stories from folks before, um, but I don't know about everyone else, but I want to just acknowledge I am not highly functional at this point that I think that this moment um, is both deeply heartbreaking and also incredibly hopeful. And it feels like there's just not enough that we can do. Um, and so I'm uh, really grateful to be with you all today. Um, I uh, co-founded a company called Promise and Promise was started about two years ago and uh, had spent a lot of time in the labor movement and in social justice movement and then music. and. Um, began to see that technology was not playing a positive role for mostly people like me or people who grew up with me and um, went into the private sector into tech to try to understand how to make it work and uh, and learned a lot. Um, and, and I think what I learned most uh, key was that uh, scale could only happen with technology. And so became very interested and I think learned a lot in uh, working in uh, tech and then decided I wanted to figure out how did technology scale innovation on behalf of the people I grew up with. And, and to understand could capital uh, not be extractive because there just weren't a lot of models of how capital worked that weren't extractive. And so Promise was started to basically scale bail reform to figure out how could you use technology so that people who didn't have money would not be stuck in jail. Um, and, and also to understand how did you innovate on behalf of poor people, people of color. And, and that's really what the company is about. Our clients are governments and we largely spend most of our time trying to figure out how to make them more effective and how to make sure that there is technology on behalf of our folks. Um, it became especially clear to me when I was talking to one of our clients and I said, this is how we're gonna build a program that's gonna help all these people. And she said to me, oh, I see where we're off. I don't care about people in the system and you do. And, and so I'd love to, to later think about like, as we think about innovation and technology, what do we do when there's not markets for innovation for our folks that when the markets are actually incentivized to criminalize or incarcerate folks. And so we spend a lot of time trying to find out as a company, where are our incentives aligned with people when our values are met? And so our clients are all over the country and we focus on both keeping people out of jail without paying bail 
and increasingly how to keep people out of the criminal justice system because of debt. Thank you so much, Phaedra. I'm gonna go next to Marcus. Yeah, no, thank you for, for, for that, Phaedra. You know, it's interesting. Um, I've been following Promise for quite some time now, and, and it's amazing what you guys are building. And so I'm so grateful to be able to be here. I share the same sentiment where it's very challenging to, to log on and bring my best self to these kinds of these kinds of events, you know, when, you know, I'm checking my timeline and I'm seeing more and more of the horrific stories that are clouding conversations that I'm having to have with my nine-year-old son. And it's just challenging. You know, and 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 and, and uh, there's an interesting mix there between that and the conversations that I have to shift from once I get off. You know, once I'm in engaging with him, and then I have to shift in talking to others who don't look like me or don't come from the same neighborhoods I have come from, and they don't share the same sentiment. And I have to educate. And so there's a piece there that you know it, it doesn't it just doesn't allow me to be able to bring myself my best self. So thank you, Phaedra, for setting that tone and allowing us to be able to to have a little grace there. Um, I'm the CEO of Flick Shop. Uh, we built a technology that helps families uh, and businesses stay connected to their incarcerated loved ones. Uh, our users are able to download our mobile app that allows you to be able to send a picture, add some quick text, press send, and for 99 cents, we print uh, that picture and text on a real tangible postcard that we ship um, to, to over 2,700 facil prison facilities around the country. Uh, we've connected over 170,000 families so far with our technology and ship. Um, almost 600,000 Flickshop postcards. Uh, and it's one of the things I'm really, really proud of because uh, when I was in prison, uh, I wish that there was a technology like this that existed that allowed me to be able to stay closer to um, my friends, whether it be the girlfriend at the time at the earlier stage of the, of the bid or later on, even with my cousins who were promised that they would write me letters. But the reality of it is that it's just too hard to sit down and write a letter and lord knows no one knows how to print a photo from their phone any longer and so um you know we realized that we had uh, we had a massive market that we wanted to attack uh that needed to leverage our technologies uh i went to prison when i was a 15 year old kid um for stealing a car from someone and the judge gave me eight years in adult maximum security prisons as a result of that car theft um, and, and, and as a 15 year old kid growing up in prison, you know, spending your 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, all of those birthdays inside of prison, it develops this sense of hopelessness and depression that is naturally starts to breed itself within those walls, especially when you sentence to spend your time in maximum security prisons where everybody else has enormous amounts of time. And so my mom saw that level of depression starting to breed itself inside of me. And she made a promise in a prison visit room that she would not let me die to prison culture and that she would write me a letter or send me a photo every day for the remaining several years of my of my sentence there and that's the singular thing that saved my life it allowed me to be able to see the window to the world the same way that most of us digest social media and other digital content that people in prison didn't have access to we wanted to be able to make that seamless for our customers um, so we're excited to be able to make that happen and, and to join inside of this fight of trying to figure out ways to be able to bring a more equitable equitable environment to people that are going to be transitioning out of those cells and coming back home to our communities Thank you so much, Mark. Is that a beautiful example of, of love and tech and purpose and, and family and community coming together? Yeah, thank Anil, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Anil, share, share a little bit of your why and, and why you start your organization. Sure thing. Uh, thanks, Lillian. Thanks, everybody. Um, you know, I want to start by actually just sort of acknowledging, right? Like, I, I'm a child of Indian American immigrants. And so while I'm part of a marginalized community, I'm not part of a community that is over-policed, that is over-prosecuted, that is disproportionately sentenced, right? And, and that's a privilege that, you know, I wasn't aware of growing up. And it was really actually tech that sort of brought me to understanding a lot of that. Because even though we were, you know, my parents were first generation immigrants and I was able to come here and have a career and have an opportunity, I saw tech open the doors for me. I saw it being able to be a a path to mobility, to stability, to to being able to provide for you know my family. I, like Marcus, I got a nine-year-old son too, and you know you feel that obligation every day. And um, when I was coming up, my peers were the people that went on to create uh, the social networks we all use every day. So I knew the founders of Twitter, the founders of LinkedIn, the founders of any platform you've heard of at the beginning, and I saw both their optimism. I mean, I think they did have, you know, the, the positive intent of having people share information, 
Um, and, then, and then the blind spots, what they did not know about who was being excluded from the systems and who was included from the beginning and who was going to profit from them and who was not. And, um, you know, and, and, and even in my own work in building some of the early social tools, I definitely saw you know, everybody takes credit for all the positive things that happen. So when people see a hashtag for Black Lives Matter, when people say hashtag for, for the Me Too movement, they take credit for that. But when they see the harassment and the abuse and the radicalization, when they see the normalization of, of you know, of really authoritarianism in America and people supporting police violence, uh, they don't cre take credit for that part. And so it was a really interesting thing to see that tech is both that thing that can free and liberate people and that thing that can uh, you know, literally imprison them, right? And, and that there was an obligation around the technology. And it took me back to, you know, the stories I was raised in of my great grandfather marching with Gandhi and talking about the, one of the most powerful tools that he had. And it's still in the attic of my parents' house in India, uh, was a printing press. And it was what they used to print up pamphlets and to print up newspapers and, um, and, you know, for me, there was a straight line connection between that technology of its time, you know, almost, you know, the better part of a century ago, and what for them was a, a fundamental human rights battle. Uh, and what we see today is like, can technology again be a tool that people who are marginalized can use to free themselves and have control over their own destiny? And then, you know, the truth of it is I, I run a tech startup these days. I run a company where people make apps for each other. And so thinking a lot about can the orientation of that kind of effort be towards justice? Can we think about what is our business model? How do we make money? Who do we hire? Who do we impact? How do we affect the world around us and who benefits from it? And have that be oriented towards, towards justice for people. Uh, so that's the obligation I feel. And, and I'm lucky to get to be part of these conversations and, and, and talk about it. Great. Thank you, Anil. You shared a lot of great points of uh, the world, the tech, and the opportunity, which will go a little bit deeper after this as well. Uh, John, please introduce yourself and your why. And your uh, sure. Yeah. I, um, you know, I had the great privilege to grow up uh, around computers. My dad got a PC right when they came out. So ever since I was a kid, I you know, grew up programming them, fell in love with them. Um, but really my, my, my sort of journey into criminal justice reform came uh, when I married a uh, federal public defender. Um, and, and, you know, sort of her stories, her sort of understanding of the criminal justice system opened my eyes to a lot of things. Um, through her, I became friends with Nick Turner, who's the executive director of the Vera Institute of Justice. Um, and, and ended up, uh, he invited me to, to join the board of that, which I'm very privileged to be on. Um, and, and, you know, one thing in, 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 in talking with Nick, talking with my wife, um, you know, I realized all the things that we've been bombarded with, that I had been bombarded with throughout my life, um, you know, that made incarcerated people seem less than human. All the messages we get of, um, in our society and I really wanted to figure out ways to try to break the back of that, right? Um, and there's a lot of ways technology can do that. Vera is doing a lot of interesting work of sort of understanding the numbers um, around the criminal justice system. But at the same time, you know, you really need a human connection in order to make that real. And I was able, you know, to, to meet and, and form relationships with, with currently and formerly incarcerated people both through the work of um, the federal public defenders um, and through the work Vera is doing, um, you know, improving the conditions of mass incarceration in a lot of different institutions. Great, thank you so much. For the folks who may not know Vera, definitely uh, check out the organization for other ways to get involved and in, in do this work as well. As, and as we transition more into what Anil started alluding, which is the power that tech can have, right, to, to tackle uh, racial equity. And I would say that there are some folks that would question that, and, but I think we're here to, to show the opportunity that it can and, and how do we build responsibly. And so I think it's really important to be able to be very critical of technology. Um, but with that said, what I will, and this is open to anybody that would like to jump in. Um, with that said, tech is uniquely positioned, but what are the, the current challenges, some of the biggest challenges that you may see specifically as we apply it to this, to this sector and this area, uh, what is a future state that you ideally would see and, and can imagine for technology to play a role here? I 
the meaty, meaty question. Why don't we start with that's Phaedra? A big, that's a big one. That's a big oh. one. <laughs> oh, got it. Okay, and I'm happy to jump in. Anil, do you want to go before I jump in? Um, okay, yes, always, Lily. Um, so I guess first I see the challenge at multiple levels. I probably see it uh, most selfishly as someone who isn't from tech and who's been in it. So it's so weird because tech is such a homogenous community that sees itself as very diverse and like a meritocracy. <laughs> so as someone who came into it, it, it was shocking. One, because I've never heard people talk about where they went to college as grownups outside of football. And so it was like, oh, they went to Stanford MBA. They did this. And I was like, we talk about where 40 year olds went to college. <laughs> and so that, uh, so I would say, as I think about tech, there's a couple of real challenges and then I think opportunities. Uh, I think the first challenge is that it functions on pattern recognition, which is in things like hiring, you hire people that you know or people that you recognize. And so that means like it's when you think about scale, that is you think about the ability to break down pieces and to iterate and get better and better, that, that one thing we should acknowledge is there are universities that train people very specifically to do that. But what that means then is that people get hired who do that most easily. And so uh, I think the challenge is first on getting a job, um, which is I'm the, I am a working class kid. So I always think about that before I think about entrepreneurship. <laughs> it's like how to get employed. Uh, and I think the first challenge is it's hard to get a job if you're different then. And, and I mean different than by where you went to school, the color of your skin, forget having been impacted by the justice system. Mm -hmm. um, so one is how do you get into tech, which I think is very difficult if you didn't go to a certain school, if you don't look a certain way, or if you don't have the resources to say, hey, I wanna be able to not to make $50,000 for a year, which is somehow glamorized in tech, which is like no one I know can go to college and then afford to make 50, thousand dollars a year and not have to support themselves pay back college loans and like I always tell people it's not glamorous we shouldn't acknowledge like people don't need to get paid in equity they need to get paid in salaries mm -hmm. um so one is I think getting into tech can be difficult then I think creating a company and I think accessing um fundraising and how do you access capital to create your own company because mostly people invest in those same type of patterns and I think that can be really difficult so I think as we think about criminal justice and we think about opportunity, I think we have to acknowledge the system isn't made for us. And, and so then the question is, how do you both function in a system that isn't made for you? And then how do you create new systems that are? And um, I think about it, I was walking, watching Marcus and totally appreciating his hustle, which to me is the best skill. He held up his thing and he was like, and this is how my product works and this is how you can use it. And I thought to myself, gosh, I missed that opportunity. And so I think one is recognizing that pattern. Like for me, it's people who know how to hustle and sell and make and, and scale. So one is I think we have to create patterns that say, this is a different way to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, I think second is we have to make the case like, we're in a broken system that criminalizes us because of where we grew up, what we look like and who we know. And so to the extent that we don't identify those skill sets as important, I think that's a tragedy. And so our job, I think about Marcus's job, I think my job, I think Neil's job is to be able to say, one is we, I feel like I have to win so that I can create models for other people to win too. And so one is, I think I've ra we've raised about $12 million. It's like, we have to use those resources to build a company that's scalable and wins and also does it with ethics, which is the way we treat people, the way we operate, and then the products we sell. And so one is I think we have to win. The second is we have to win with different types of people. And so we have to win with people who didn't all get MBAs at a specific school, who didn't like go to business school, then work at McKinsey, then from McKinsey, they took a got at Google, then at Google, <laughs> they go to work at a startup. We, we have to say, we have to build companies that work different. And so I think, I think the way in which we operate has got to be different. The way in which we involve people who are impacted by the justice system, because those are the people we are and we grew up with. And then last is, I think the thing I worry about sometimes is that we think that there's a decision between being different or winning. And I think the real obligation of us is to show that you can win in a market, but that you should also win in a way that is, I always think makes me proud of my Nana. Like, would my Nana be proud of me? Could she go to church and talk about what I'm doing? And so I just think there's real opportunity for us to win in a way with people like us and make the case that people in technology can be different. And I think, uh, 
And I think also to, to recognize our own privilege of participating in this system because uh, I'm cognizant of how lucky we are to get to be here. Thank you, Phaedra. Hope everybody's been taking notes because that, that was like just a lot of knowledge that's been shared. Um, thank you so Phaedra much. Phaedra is like dropping jewels. Like there was like a several <laughs> drop the mic moments there. Like you got an amen corner over here. I think one of the things I think is really interesting and you're gonna hear it over and over again is you know, when, whether or not we're talking about data, how we receive data around some of the players who you know we appeal our product to um, and, and how we play and how we develop uh, our tech and, and, and knowing that you know the big consumer base for the majority of our companies are folks who we typically box out of opportunities um, or they lack the opportunity to be able to be creators in tech. Um, how we have conversations around access to the tech sector and um, how we collaborate with others even um, when you can't see the immediate revenue demand, I think is also going to be one of the barriers as we think about how to involve more inside of the space. I mean, we've seen it in sports and in hip hop and, and the tech sector is the newest place where the players that, you know, they can innovate in interesting ways. And I think that uh, in that, in, unless we see that trend, you know, happening, I mean, pattern recognition is it's a great one. It's Phaedra, I'm like tweeting that later. But like, you know, the, the, how we think about this and we've seen the patterns of it in the past, um, but we have the opportunity now to be able to reshape the way that we think, that, think about this inside of the tech sectors. Because we didn't do it right until, you know, much later when we saw others involving themselves and we, in, inside of the sports and, and, and music industries. Um, tech is the new hip hop. Hashtag tech is a new hip hop. And you know what you're also going to jump in with. How do you respond? Yeah, to that? I mean, that's a perfect setup. There, there's so many things to connect through there. I, I think the first thing to take a step back is when we say tech, what do we mean? Right. Mm -hmm. So there are a handful, uh, you know, maybe half a dozen of these trillion dollar companies, Facebook and Apple and Google and you know, Microsoft and, and Amazon. And they are there and they are called your global cultural institutions. They're almost like governments and the power that they have in the world. And then there are small independent companies. There's, there's you know, the, the sort of services that solve a problem for you, for your community, for your need that are not even aspiring to be a trillion dollar company. They just want to sort of be there and purpose for it. And it's really important to talk about this thing separately because it's like so much of the conversation is dominated by here's what Google did, here's what Facebook did, here's, you know, YouTube, whatever. But that's a small part of the total number of people who are working. That's a small number, you know, subset of the, the categories of problems that can be solved. And their alignment is much further apart. Like what they're trying to do in the world, I mean, I, I'm only slightly overstating this, like racial justice is not a concern for any of those companies. Reforming the criminal justice system is not a concern for any of those companies. And those companies will continue to, th to survive and thrive if we never fix what is wrong with the criminal justice system and the policing system in this country. It will not hurt Facebook's share price, it will not hurt Google's revenues, right? And so like, that's a fundamental thing we have to talk about. Now, I hope they, they, they get enlightened and they, they see the light and they say, you know, we are not sustainable in the long term unless we step towards justice. And, and, and I hope that they, they have the sort of moral imperative to do that. But I also know, you know, we talk about that pipeline Phaedra described, if you go to Stanford and you go to this program and this guy's, I mean, they talk casually about what professor they had, like, we're all going to know that guy's name. I'm like, I've never heard any of these dudes, right? But that's, that's their, you know, familiarity with each other. That's how narrow their context is. And yet I look at, and, and I think Marcus said this, Phaedra said this, I look at the disciplines where we actually have equity for people who have been push to the margins and, and absolutely music is a template for this. Absolutely sports. If your talent is, is athletics right now, you, we see today athletes seizing their power and saying we can actually shift the conversation and culture about what's happening. We have seen musicians, I mean, Fader and I have talked about this at length, is, is saying I wanna own my work and I'm gonna control how it goes out in the world because I am a creator, right? And we know every time we buy a jersey, it's got somebody's name on the back. And every time you, you know, back, back in the day, we buy records, CDs, you read the liner notes and it says, this is who made it. And every single app on our phones, we have no names. We have no idea who built them. We don't know where they come from. We don't know if they're from our communities. And so I can tell you, when I look at a movie, I can look at the credits and I can look at, you know, scrolling up at the end of Netflix and I'd be like, that's why the music's good on this, right? That's why, oh, that's why this movie was it just, it was just hitting because like, of course, that's who, who was doing the music and we know they're going to you know, have a great soundtrack. And you look at an app and you're like, well, 
I can't even see, there's no accountability. There's nobody who's going to say, I made this, and I created this, and I can't, let alone to say, oh, they're from my community. We have never in our lives heard somebody say, oh, that's how we learned to make apps in, in the church I grew up in. We have never had somebody said, I sat on my father's knee on the porch, and that's how he taught me to make a website. That doesn't exist, right, in the communities in the way that we absolutely are like, this is how my mom taught me to make Thanksgiving dinner. You know what I mean? Like, like absolutely, we have traditions in food and culture and the things that, are, that speak to our souls and also that are accountable to our communities. And technology doesn't exist in that realm yet. So if we can understand, especially the tech that is not from those, like it's a five, six giant companies, but the tech that is from people, are they from our communities? Do they understand our values? Are they oriented towards the values that we have? Are they grounded in the tradition and the culture we're from? If you do that, then the rest takes care of itself. Then the business model is not going to be ext extractive. Then the labor workforce is going to be diverse. Then they're going to respect their workers. Then they're going to build a product that makes the world better. But only if it sort of has the same expectations we have from every other creative discipline. If we look at whatever, somebody taking photos, so, you know, somebody, somebody making music, somebody making a film, somebody making anything that speaks to us, clothing, art, any of it. Those are the things that end up being responsible in the world. And until tech is working that way, or the tech we use every day is working that way, until we can look at an app on our phone and say, that was made by this person who cares about the things I care about from a community that's legible to me that I can see, it doesn't change until that happens. That's such an interesting yeah. um, aspect of, of seeing how the narrative is gonna change, right? Like here in, in Silicon Valley, the whole concept of like software will eat hardware. As a recovering double E, I know that the, the software definitely moves faster and cheaper, right? You're able to scale it in different ways, which is what has led that scale, scale, scale in some of these unsustainable, to be honest, right? As we're seeing how the, the pandemic and COVID, a lot of these startups that got caught in between, whether they're making it or not, I think it's also another aspect of some questioning some of those business models. Um, but now I think what you're alluding to is that culture will eat software as we start to get a different demographic and as we get also smarter consumers and creators. And I definitely, that's one of the part that I do see and why I'm passionate about technology myself, because I also take a look at the Gen Zers who are growing up with so much more information, but also questioning and asking and really, and really standing up and be like, why are you using it? I want to see the back end and like, yeah, put it all culture, on yeah, culture decides everything. I mean, just real quick, you think about, not a one of us looked at our phone and said, I'm going to look at every single photo app that's in the app store and pick the one that has the best filters at a technical level. That is not what we did. We ended up on Instagram because our friends are there. And that is about culture because the influencers are there and the people we care about are there. The tech people are still thinking, well, I have to have the best filters and the best software and the best algorithm, the best technology. And it's like, that is, that is the old logic. Right? It is absolutely about people connecting to people. And, and hopefully that is enough power to unseat some of these platforms and, and move us towards you know, the places where the people who care about us are who we're connecting to. And taking that dialogue, yeah. this is a good question for John, because sure. as, the, as the CTO and architect diving right into the, the, how the technology and managing the teams on a global scale that you've had, I know previously before we were talking about also just the, the bias and also the, just the weapons of math destruction, right? So I was curious yeah. to get your point and reaction into all of this uh, from your role as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, look, and in, in, in to pick up on what, on what um, Phaedra and Anil were saying, and I 100% agree, but remember, it's not just the four giant tech companies versus the startups, right? Um, Goldman Sachs is one third computer programmers um, by employee count, right? Walmart has a vast number of, of computer programmers, right? They, so these jobs are, are part of the lifeblood of just, you know, keeping, you know, these are going to be a large portion of the middle class jobs that are available um, in the United States, right? Um, and I mean, 100% correct, like Fader, you could not be more right about the sort of the path into these jobs through McKinsey, etc. Anil, right, this sort of this, you know, new version of a good old boys network that exists, right? And a lot of these companies, and I've, I've seen it at a number of them, you know, spend a lot of time um, focused on diversity hiring for the junior people, mm -hmm. right? Like, can we get kids out of college? What are our diversity stats there? Um, and then tend to not take it as seriously in lateral hiring, where you see, um, um, you know, just much worse diversity stats. 
And furthermore, once people get into these companies, what is the support network, right? What's being done to prevent the, you know, oh, well, I went to Stanford or, you know, we both summer in East Hampton, so we have that in common, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you create a culture within these very large companies? And they don't have to be Google, right? They can be, there's hundreds of companies like this. Um, how do you create this culture that gives opportunities for people who don't come from those same backgrounds to show their value, to be included, right? To be thought of and say, hey, we need to put together a team to do this. Who do we need, right? You don't just go to the same people that you always go to. Um, I think, you know, managers at tech companies need to really seriously engage with that in a way that I think is not happening right now. Um, and, and, you know, you mentioned Weapons of Math Destruction, right? Uh, which is a fantastic book um, by a woman, Kathy O'Neill, right? Arguing that, that, you know, a lot of the early selling point on artificial intelligence was that this was going to be the great equalizer, right? It's a computer. How can a computer be biased, right? I think it was, it was AOC who got flack very unfairly for saying, you know, that, that algorithms were biased. Of course they're biased, right? All AI does is reinforce patterns that it observes in the data it's given, right? So it all depends on what data you give these machine learning algorithms, right? And then they just regurgitate that back. Um, and if you give it biased data, which much of the data that we have represents the biased world we live in, um, you're going to get these biased things, right? It's almost like the hiring practices at big tech companies run by people are, you know, parallel to these AI processes. And on that end, I think as we take a look at, you know, AI and the emerging technologies, I think it brings, it brings up the point that Pedro made earlier as well of creating new markets, right? When uh, there are problems that we also have, there's so much technology, there's so much talent being, and no disrespect to the folks who love dog apps, but there's just so much talent going to that, right? And so what about using some of the brain power and talent and energy to solve some of the more critical problems? And so I was curious, and this question is for Phaedra and, and uh, Marcus, feel free to whoever wants to jump in, but as you were also getting ready to start your own company, creating this type of new markets, what were some of the the, the uh, obstacles that you had that you, going back to when you first started your company, what would you tell yourself of uh, the advice that you would give yourself in creating some of these new, new opportunities and specifically because of the lived journey that you've had um, that, um, that I wanted to just tease it a little bit more. Pedro, I'll let you take it first. <laughs> Marcus. <laughs> uh, I think what I would tell myself, one is I would raise as much money as possible, which is not what traditionally venture capitalists or people tell you. They're like, just raise a little at whatever valuation and then later go back. I'm so glad we raised more money because now we can ride through COVID and also figure some stuff out. Um, the second thing I would think about is you need to build a team who looks and feels like you that you're comfortable with. I think in the beginning, I was like, oh, I need to hire impressive people so that they're all, you know, like I look like I'm really like hot stuff and that they're gonna solve problems in a way that I don't have skills. And what I realized is the problem is they don't get our folks and they build product in a way that actually um, is harmful to our communities because they don't understand. And so one example is we were talking about payment systems and I was like, Mon money needs to come out at 6 a.m. the day someone gets paid. And someone, and I, an engineer on my team said, well, why does that matter? It doesn't matter when you take the money out. And I was like, so I can tell you got money because if you don't have money, you know you planned <laughs> where that money went before you got the money. And by the time the bank opens, your money's already gone. And so the idea that that person would build product for someone instead of understanding implicitly what it's like to struggle and not have money means that they're going to build a product that doesn't serve that person. And so I think what I wish I would have told myself is it didn't really matter what everyone else thought. It mattered how could I, as a Black woman, best build a company that served Black and Brown people and then be able to win. So I think that's important. The second thing I would say that I wish I would have done is your feelings are gonna get hurt because you're gonna try it. I was like, I'm for the people, I'm with the people. That's why I spent my whole life doing that. And the first people that critiqued me were people in the movement. And so I was like, my heart was broken. <laughs> I was like, 
And because I come out of a pragmatic movement where I just was like, when you're in the labor movement, it was just like, when working people are paying your salary, they don't care what anyone else thinks. They're like, make sure the world is better and my employment is better. My family's life is better. So I came out of a world where it was very measured. Like, you know, did you win in this specific way? And so what I wish I would have told myself is not to measure myself by what other people thought, but to measure myself by my own definition of what did I think I could contribute to the world. Um, and, uh, but also not to have so much ego, which I did, because I was like, my solution is the perfect solution, but to listen to people in a different way, to not maybe, they might not be the right solutions for me, but to recognize that I needed to create space and place for people who are doing the work before I was. So that was kind of learning. Uh, last is, uh, I think to figure out what your own pattern is, um, because I don't know that I like, so I am great at execution and I don't think I'm great at creating a market that doesn't exist. That's not my skill set. And so what I needed to assess is how to create a company that was an execution challenge, not a create a new market challenge. And, and so I think our company is starting to do very well. And the reason we're starting to do very well is because I was like, my people are execution people. My people are like, we can make magic in a place that hasn't existed before. It's just not my skill set. So now building a, across my own skills is important. Um, the last thing is, um, I don't know uh, a lot of people who got told we could fail, but most companies in tech fail. And so as an entrepreneur, I had to give my team permission to fail, which mm -hmm. is like, as a person of color who grew up, you know, like all of us grew up, a lot of us grew up like broke with single parents. Uh, I went to Cal State Northridge. I, you know, I had to support my sister. She lived with me through school. So I didn't have a model. My only model was I'm the first one out. I got to make enough money where I can help support the rest of my family. So there was no solution that was like, just fail. And I think the luxury we have to figure out for ourselves and for the other people we hire is, is that maybe us failing in a specific task can look like winning. And because most companies fail, most people fail, but like, you know, people who grew up with resources, money, whose parents are thinking, they're like, oh, my first company fails. I'm going to do my second company. Whereas for me, I was like, if this doesn't work, I'm going to like lay in shame. I'll never get a job again. I won't be able to support my family. And so I think also creating the dynamics for people like us to understand that failure can be a predictor of success instead of a predictor of continued failure. Okay, thank you, thank you. Mic drop, you're next, Marcus. <laughs> no, this is good. Um, I think, you know, some, some of the things that, you know, I, I like to talk to um, some of our young entrepreneurs who are in the Flick Shop School of Business where we train other entrepreneurs that are living inside of these prison sales now to be able to come home and create their own sex path. Um, one of the things that we focus a lot on is uh, how to build systems. Um, I, I was, you know, I did a horrible job at building systems when we first launched. Um, I had a, a fire sprinkler strategy um, versus a fire hygiene strategy and thought that if I went wide, I would be able to cover more ground and be able to amass more revenue, which would lead to more business, stronger product. Um, and I've learned to focus very more, you know, more narrowly on a specific market and a specific product and learn from that and build systems that allow for stronger um, lagging outcomes later. Um, and also, um, you know, as to credit back to Phaedra, um, we hire around some of those efficiencies in our system now. We learned how to do that later in the process where we, you know, initially were like, look, we're going to set a goal and we're going to work toward it. And then later on, realize we didn't meet the goal in a repeat process one through three all over again. And we realized that didn't work. Um, and so we learned how to be able to build a system to help us with that. One of the other things that I think that was um, helpful, uh, you know, that I learned later on after, you know, being in the game for a bit was um, learning how to leverage my experiences that I had it, that I've always thought were, uh, you know, something that crippled me in the past, like learning how to manage, you know, my own emotional intelligence on a prison rec yard at 17 years old was something that I look back on now and see how it allows me to be able to navigate rooms now and, and learn how to be able to no longer have a hindrance when I walk into a room and talk to people about some of my problem sets, right? Um, you know, I walk into investor calls now and I'm like, you know, worst case scenario, they say no. Like just a few years ago, I was hustling honey buns, you know, in, in a housing unit, right? So dude, you have much better problems now. So yeah, it gives me perspective. Um, and I think that the last one um, that I think that, you know, it, it's, it's been important to me is um, understanding how important brand is and how it sticks along the journey. 
uh, building a brand. When we first, learned, you know, my first launch flick shop, it was like, you know, it isn't now, like now, today now, when we understand criminal justice reform has become a sexy topic. When we first launched in 2012, no one was talking about this. It was still, we were still going, you know, with the lock them up and throw them away the key, lock them, throw them away the key kind of sort of way of thinking about this. And now, at the, you know, it's become a little bit more celebritized where I'm grateful that we're having these shifting conversations because the men and women that are coming behind me will not have to jump over half the barriers that, you know, some of the trendsetters had to, you know, when we first started to open up this space. Um, but I, but, but what, I, what I went into this thinking was like, you know, Marcus, it's okay to be able to share your narrative and under, help folks understand that, Everyone that comes out of these sales doesn't look like what they, what the news and the media portrays to them on the seven o'clock news. And if you figure out a way to be able to help reshape that narrative, then you'll be able to build a brand that you can continue to leverage along the journey that will allow our users to be able to identify with me and why it's important to use our product. And also self-identify with each other and then now they become now flick shoppers. Right? They're no longer just people who use FlickShop. They self-identify as Flick shoppers because we established brand um, very, very early in, in, in the game. Great, thank you so much. And, and I know we're running close on time and there's quite a few questions coming in the Q&A. So please keep them coming. We're, well, we have a few more minutes, uh, but I wanted to, to ask Neil um, and John a few questions, especially because of your experience in growing larger companies and the different global footprints you have. And this is a little bit more on uh, what are some of the, the misconceptions and maybe other peers, other CEOs you've had? So if you had the opportunity, so just a little bit similar to what I did with Pedro and Marcus, if you had an opportunity to go back to yourself and, and be able to, to share those advices when you were, I mean, being at Goldman Sachs, right? Being at the different types of companies and, and what are, going back, what would you tell yourself? What would you do different? And then also who would you hold more accountable? <laughs> Um, yeah, what would I tell myself? I mean, there's, you know, um, looking back now, I think that we probably missed a lot of opportunities, right, to go after talent in ways that were more creative. You know, we're starting to do some of those now, um, you know, starting to do you know, much less of just, hey, show up on the campuses we always used to go to and interview a whole bunch of people that look like the people we've got, which had been the traditional hiring model at a lot of places for many years, right? So now trying to get a much more diverse set of schools, um, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to remove as much bias as possible from the interviewing process, right? There's a lot of interesting research that shows that like direct face-to-face in-person interviews are roughly completely worthless in the hiring process. All they do is reinforce stereotypes that you know, preconceived notions that you already have, right? Um, you know, we develop technology where, you know, one of the main, things in a tech interview, right, is a sort of coding challenge, right? What can people actually do, right? Um, we have a web-based tool that we do now, which starts with you know, problems are presented, like fix this code. And that's done with just, you know, the interviewee typing. There's only chat communication between the, um, you know, the interviewer and the interviewee. We're trying to get as close as possible to the sort of, you know, Orchestras used to be highly, gender diversity in orchestras was almost non-existent. Then they started auditioning people behind a curtain. You had no idea who was playing the instrument. And, you know, gender diversity roughly became equal in, in universities. We looked for ways to you know, recreate that model, right? Um, and this was one way to do that. And, and I think, you know, we should have been challenging ourselves more to figure out ways to to stop, you know, sort of perpetuating the, you know, exactly what Anil and Phaedra were talking about earlier on, right? The same kinds of people from the same kinds of schools with the same backgrounds who all look the same, right? That will just perpetuate itself if those people don't do something to try to stop it, don't realize that it's a problem and don't take that problem seriously, right? Um, and there's also, you, you know, uh, there's a business case to be made, right? If you don't have a diverse workforce, you're ignoring vast amounts of, of a talent pool and just different kinds of creativity, right? To, to Phaedra's point about the payment system, right? You need people who have different experiences to think about things in different ways 
and that makes your companies stronger and your products better. So yeah, I mean, just to add on to that, I think I, I think those points are really solid. And I think there's a couple things I would say to myself. I think the first, um, and this is actually still something I say to like other CEOs or founders or whoever I talk to, which is like in my heart or in my gut 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I, you know, when I started really thinking about this seriously, I, I actually just thought I was going to leave tech and not come back. I was like, they, they don't care about what I care about. I'm not meant for this industry. Maybe I'm never going to come back to it. And um uh, and, and, you know, I was terrified. Like I, I, there was an article I was quoted in where I was critical of Facebook and basically it was told you're never going to work in this industry again. And, you know, you're never going to work. And I, you know, fortunately I didn't want to be in Silicon Valley. So that was fine. But like the sense of like that I would never have an opportunity again, it was terrifying. And it was, and it was scary. And I think people actually know what is right and they're afraid to say it. Right. And, and it's doubly so if you are anybody who is marginalized, anybody who is going to be underestimated because of how you look or because of where you come from, right? And so, so many of us actually do know, you know what, that's not right, or that's going to hurt somebody, or that's going to cause a problem, or you're missing an opportunity, or whatever it is. And so like the number one thing I would say to my past self, or to the people that I talk to now, or even like the young people coming up that I mentor, is like, you, you actually have pretty good instincts, you actually do know right from wrong. You actually do know what opens doors. You actually do know what it is to be in that room and look around and there is nobody like you and it feels uncomfortable and you don't want to be the one to have to say it, but sometimes you can't not say it. Like that whole thing, I think it, it gets in your head and every single one of us that has been through that process of like, come home at the end of the day, I mean, like, why am I so exhausted? <laughs> and it turns out it's twice as exhausting to do the work and do the work about the work. Right. I think that sort of is, is, is really there. I think the other part, you know, to John's point, um, there is a business opportunity. Like we must always ground the argument in the moral case. That always has to be the, the fundamentals. I don't ever want it to be, well, you don't want to do the moral thing, but you, we will bribe you into doing it because there's a business case. Like that doesn't work and people actually are fickle. They will find a way to route around what it, like it, it, but you have to start from, you have an obligation as a human to push for justice for everybody that you can. Right. Now, if we can agree on that level, then we can move on to what do you do about it? And that is where there is a business opportunity. So, and, you know, as John said, there's talent out there that you can miss out. There are markets out there that you can miss out on if you're not being inclusive. What I think much about is risk. Entrepreneurs are always thinking about risk, right? It is always risk and reward. One of the reasons that people who have been pushed to the margins suffer is because we can't take as much risk. Right. If you are, you know, and, and, and my family's sending money back home to take care of folks and other folks, it's like because you got somebody that's out of work and you got to support them, whatever it is. You're like, I can't risk the sure thing for the maybe thing if my whole family, my whole community is depending on me. So that's one level of risk. The other part is for a lot of us, if we fail, that's it. And not only is that it for us, everybody who looks like us gets a demerit too, right? It's like, well, we bet on one person, one guy like him, and it didn't work out. So why are we going to take that risk? And that risk framework is where the industry and, and, and apologies, John, and finance, right, where the money comes from, that actually is where um, we have to shift the conversation about risk. Because I look at if your organization is not thinking about the people who have been most marginalized, if your organization is not thinking about the people who have been denied opportunity most systematically, then your organization is at risk. Think about if Facebook had had people in power understanding how misinformation hurts people. Because the world, the circles I'm in, everybody knew it. They're like, they're spreading lies. It is radicalizing people. It is going to lead to violence. It is going to warp elections. It is going to warp media. That whole conversation has been going on for 10 plus years. And all the activist circles I know and all the sort of, and, and academia, all these other disciplines, right? But Facebook put themselves at risk now. And I think it's existential. I actually think you, know, you look at why are there congressional hearings about breaking up these giant companies. They put themselves at risk because they could not empower somebody that understood that they have an obligation to act. And it's because people don't feel it. They don't feel the pain of it. They aren't the ones being targeted, right? And, and that's actually, I, I think it's just so vital. And so, so that framework really works. If you talk about what does it take for an entrepreneur who is not coming from the usual suspects, the usual places, and wants to come in and see opportunity. 
say to that person that you are trying to get a check from, or you're trying to have be your first customer, or you're trying to get to invest, you, not just are you missing out on the chance to succeed and all that kind of stuff, you are taking a risk if you don't bet on me. You are taking a risk if you don't see that what I'm doing is value. If you don't understand my perspective, you are increasing your risk and that's on you, right? And I think that's like, you know, it's a big lift to have a confidence when you've been pushed down and beat down and, you know, like to, to come back and have the confidence to say, no, you're the one that's missing out. But that's actually where you have to start from. And if you don't have somebody to gas you up, somebody that's like your hype man to tell you that, like you got to find those people, you know, support you, be in your community. It's that's family, friends, whatever. But if you have that, and, and if you need it, you know, everybody ping me, you know, I'm on Twitter, hit me up. Like, it, it, but if you got somebody to tell you to, to do that, then you can reframe it to the rest of the world, which is if you don't have the talent from these people you've been denying and, and, and pushing aside, if you don't have their skills, their ideas, the opportunities, the things that they see in the world, then you're the one at risk. You're the organization at risk. And I love that reframing of, of who, who has the power, right? And I, I do think that for all the folks who are there, there's over 150 folks online. Welcome to your hype team. We're, we got you. This is why we're here today, to be able to share these stories, for you all to be able to feel seen and be inspired and be able to also hear from, from folks who've been at different journeys and who many have been in your shoes. Um, and, I, and I do definitely, especially as somebody who um, started my career as a software engineer, I learned early on of being able to ask the questions of why are we building this? Who is it hurting? Who is it helping? And it took me leaving actually the company and the actual field for, for me to, uh, to have that ethical discussion with myself. That was, that was, that's what I decided. But looking back, I just, want to, I just want everybody who's on the line to also be able to, fear, to, say, to say that you don't have to be in fear. This is really the opportunity where the more of us can question, can hold these companies accountable. And not just the big four, as John was mentioning, but also all the other ones that are the, the mid-sized, the startups, because a lot of, if you don't get your culture right at the beginning, to Neil's point, if it's not based fundamentally with the right leadership and central on the, on, on a, the specific problem, with equity from the beginning, it's, it's game over. And so I definitely I would, um, thank you for sharing all of that. There's just so much more I can go on that, but I want to also make sure that um, we're, we're feeling some of the, the questions here that are coming in. Um, so I'll I'm going to take uh, about one or two just to be mindful of time. Uh, there was one specifically talking about um, briefly touching on entrepreneurship in tech. Uh, we've been talking a lot about entrepreneurship, uh, but how can people effectively work towards justice within or in, an, in a partnership with the tech field? And this is a question from Bennett. Anybody that wants to take that question? What is the role of entrepreneurship? One of the things, you know, I'll take, a, I'll take a stab at this one. Uh, one of the things that I think that's gonna be very important is involving people who, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going specifically for returning citizens or if you wanna involve yourself out of justice and perform spaces. Um, I think, you know, one of the biggest parts is to involve people who actually have some kind of criminal justice background um, in, inside of the conversations and what you're building, right? The entrepreneurs, the innovators inside of these companies are going to collaborate again with people who look like me, who have an F in their chest. Well, my F stands for flick shot, but some people's F stands for just felony, right? And they're wearing this, they're wearing this F in their chest and, and, and they're wearing it and not understanding, um, as Anil said, that they are bringing a tremendous amount of value to the conversation because of their life's experiences. Um, and so I think that, you know, the entrepreneurs of the tomorrows will have the opportunities to be able to collaborate with the newest innovators that don't typically look like the innovators that come from um, the Stanford, you know, Stanford Yards. Definitely. I'm going to jump into the next question because this is actually, uh, I think, an important question to clarify. Um, which is, we were talking about how tech, this tech uh, it means it's a new hip hop. Does that mean that black people will continue to be creators but not really profit? And so let's, what do we, why don't we kind of dis, uh, discuss that piece as well? Because I do think that's really critical to, to inform that we have to be able to own the technology, right? Because as we've seen, a lot of the, the culture has also been um, uh, monetized without the creators being given the proper credit and, and ownership. So Marcus, what's your response to that? Because we, we, got, we got some comments on that. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that we're starting to learn how to be able to make that happen. I, I mean, I think that, you know, one, the technology and how we build is starting to evolve. So it allows the, the interest to it is it, just a little different. And same way the, the music industry began to evolve. Like like Rock, Rockefeller Records, Jay-Z and Dame Dash and them, they had no idea what they were building when they were launching and selling CDs out of the back of their cars. And, it, and, and when they were on Priority Records, they learned and they were, had this agile framework that allowed them to be able to pivot and then go and to sign a new record deal with Def Jam that allowed them to be able to grow and scale their business to the point where Jay-Z had ownership. I think that that same kind of path um, for in the tech sectors is going to, you know, continue to, you know, evolve and folks are going to learn. Look, let me tell you something. Like I came out of prison at 23 years old with, you know, the last grade completed was the ninth grade and, and I almost couldn't even really explain why I've been for almost the last decade of my life. But again, tech, the, the, joining the tech space has allowed me to now have social capital that allows me to be pretty much build what I want. And I think that the, the new innovators of tomorrow will have those opportunities. Um, and they just have to, I think we're gonna have to realize it and gain and give access. The talent is not lacking. I think that the access you know, to the, you know, the space is, um, and I think you know, it's, all our, it's our response, collective responsibilities to be able to figure out ways to be able to open those doors. Um, but I'll pass the ball because I mean, again, I, you know, no one saw Jay-Z or, you know, Diddy or even like Matt P, like doing what they did to help, you know, evolve hip hop to what it is today. I do, uh, I think what Marcus said, I think is really important. And, and I think it's important we first acknowledge that that's what it is right now, which is that largely companies are profiting off of black and brown talent and black and brown culture. So we should just acknowledge it is that. <laughs> There's a question of what it should be, but like, let's not pretend it's anything less than that. So let's just say that's what it is. And, and, and I think, it, I think what Jay-Z, I think and Beyonce and others represent is I, the evolution of, uh, you know, if we look at like Rock Nation, it's a deal right between Live Nation and Rock, like, and Jay-Z. And so you look at kind of the evolution of first it's a distribution, then it's a partnership, then it's an ownership. And I think you see that evolution, I think in music and I, and I think LeBron James, I think Cardi B, I think you're starting to see the evolution of first, like, you know, what I learned in music is first people want cash, right? Which is all of us who grew up without money, we're like cash, I want a million dollar record deal, right? It's like, yeah, I got that money. Then you realize it's like, oh, it's three records and I don't get the second and third money unless I perform well. And then no matter how well the record does, I don't get any more money. That's not a good deal, but it sounds like a million dollar record deal. And so I think that part of it is trying to help make sure that our folks understand the monetization of culture, which is how do people make money, right? Like we have these conversations about what does it look like to own your own um, product, right? Like does it, uh, let's say Marcus's company blows up and he makes a partnership with someone and he wouldn't do this, but he gives away 5% of his company for $2, right? Then, then he's smart enough where he'd be like, oh, I'm not doing that partnership. But for like me who grew up when I first started, I would've been like, wait, I get $2? <laughs> like, I'm taking that. That sounds like a good deal. And I'm going to be on the app store. I'll be in front of the app store for two hours, which means my family will see it. And so I think I think what's most important for us to move out of that one is to have creators, which I do think young people are doing better because I think, I think also, I think some of the work that Neil's doing and others to think about the, how people create instead of having to code or other things. I think the movement to, to create without coding being the only strategy, I think would be very important. I think the ability to open source. And I think the fact that people are having those conversations is also critical. Um, so I think open source, I think creating without code, um, I think will be really critical. And I think then just the conversations, like I think about Beyonce being like, pay me in equity. I think most people didn't know what equity was. And so the fact that popular culture is now about, I should own those assets, I think is also important. And so I think we have to train our folks. We have to train them on risk. We have to create it in our own families. But, but I, I just, I want to be as clear as possible. I think that is what it is today. And I think a couple of folks are understanding it and our obligation is to create models and also to hire people so that their families come with us, right? So that it's like our families, you know, think differently and, and start to do that. So I would just say the exploitation of black people is tech. <laughs> it is fundamentally what technology does, black and brown culture, and it monetizes it and then devalues the content. That's the model, right? Is, you, you, you look at things like Spotify, you look at music, you see that what they did is they devalued content. So like, why should you get money for content? Then they create new structures where Spotify's 
have a contract with Warner Brothers and other companies and they own a portion of Spotify. So anyway, I won't go on to my like why music sucks uh, for artists of color and legacy artists, but uh, I, I just want to say that I think Marcus is right. That's what it is. And the challenge is to evolve in the same way I think that artists are evolving. I just want to tag on that real quick. One, because Phaedra is too modest to mention it, but also it's something that I'm passionate about. We, we both learned it from Prince, right? And I think Diddy and Jay-Z and all these folks did too. And, and all these artists, there's a really, really interesting thing you can learn. You know, the one phrase uh, Prince said all the time, he's talking about master recordings are the definitive, you know, your, your actual copy of your track, your song that you made. And Prince said, if you don't own your masters, then your masters own you. And he could not be more clear, right? It was very straightforward about what equity means, what ownership means, but also very open, I think, as all of these folks are, about understand the systems you're working with, right? So if Jay-Z is like putting a record out and Samsung is bundling with their phones and he's getting paid, he's making a choice. And I think that's the thing is like, you have to have the fluency and you have to seek out by talking to people that have had the experience about knowing, what, you know, putting it very plainly, what systems are you going to be complicit in and what systems are you going to challenge? right? Because you are not going to opt out of every unjust system, like not in this world right now. And maybe you go live on an island in a cave and you're clean, right? But like, otherwise you are going to be part of something where you're like, ah, that money's going someplace I don't want to go. So you have to make a choice. You have to say, these are the places I'm going to throw in with and these are the places I'm not. I mean, I saw one of the co you know questions somebody's talking about wisely, talking about Angela Davis and, and, and her, you know, really, really decades ahead of time thinking about what are the systems that we're part of and can you be part of a system that was what you know got you incarcerated in the first place and I think you are never going to totally disengage from it. So you have to be able to say what are the parts where I'm going to be inside and what are the parts going to be outside and you have to be honest with yourself right and I see that as an entrepreneur all the time where I'm like who's going to sign this check and what am I getting you know in bed with really and that's a question you have to feel good about. You have to be able to go to sleep at night and you have to be able to look at your kids in the eye and you have to be able to make a choice. But you also have to have enough knowledge, enough information, enough context to make that choice. I think that's so vital. Like absolutely, like you need to have, again, you got to have people, you got to have friends that are going to tell you, you know, whose money you're taking or do you, are you sure you feel good about that choice? And you have to come out at the other end of the day. But it is possible to navigate. I mean, I, I, what I see from people that have been through it, people who have been, you know, like I said, I've been very privileged. People have actually had hard lives. They can make a choice that they can feel good about and they can make a choice where they can sustain themselves. And, you know, I don't think you get to building, building a trillion dollar company without making compromises I wouldn't feel good about. So that's not my ambition. On the other hand, can I give people good jobs and take care of them? And they are workers who have good benefits and, you know, all, all that good stuff and make a product we feel is good out in the world. That is a balance you can strike. And that is the thing where like, that is what every person, no matter what they've been through in their life, should have that opportunity to do it. That's kind of incumbent on all of us to give that opportunity to them to do it. Definitely. And Anil, you started going into uh, my closing question. I know we have so many questions here that I want to get to, uh, but uh, just looking at the time as well, I think what you're, what you're alluding to it, it is, I love the, the summary of understanding the systems that you're working with. Some of the questions here we're talking about, how do we impact those systems? How do we change them? Whether you're somebody in a technical role, somebody just entering the, the kids, the, the folks who are, in, who are in between or unemployed, right? Because right now the reality is that we have a lot of our community members who are currently un unemployed, don't have the school, the school degrees and whatnot. And so I, think, I do think that there's, here's an opportunity to really rethink our whole recovery and really rethink the opportunities. And, um, and I'm so glad that we were able to have a discussion of like doing away with these degrees. I wanna see what you build. I wanna see what you're creating and having the, a different sense of creativity and appreciation. And when folks come into these companies and roles, making sure that they become the leaders and that they have the, their decisions and makers and eventually own their companies, right? Um, so with that said, I wanna do a quick round for a closing. Um, what is what we have all these webinars we have different opportunities where folks are gathering in space I know and I never want to leave a space without having the, everybody share a little bit of what happens after this dialogue what are the action steps that should we be taking we learned a lot about the business model education having your hype crew but I also want to uh, ask you all to think about um, as you're in your closing thoughts what's the role of policy given where we're at given the, that it's an election year, what, what is a call to action for the folks who are currently listening to us? It's a tough one, so I'm gonna, whoever wants to jump in. Let's start with John. John, what is a call to action to, for today? Um, yeah, so look, I mean, there's, 
there's organizations to get involved with. There's there's things to give money to. But what I want to focus on, and particularly, you know, I know it's been talking a lot about entrepreneurship. I come from the much more bureaucratic, large company side of tech. And there, what I want to say, particularly to to privileged people, white people who who may be listening to this, who are going to end up in management roles, like, what are you going to do? to foster, to actually foster, truly foster a diverse workplace, right? Which means with individual people, right? Who are not like you, are you going to be checking in with them? You know, are they gonna be on the list of people you call when you have a special project or a problem? Or is it just gonna be the people who, you know, have the same life experience you do, right? And that takes real conscious effort, right? To understand you know, people who are different from you, what is their life experience, right? Can you ask them to work a weekend? Is their life set up in a way where they can work a weekend? You know, don't make that assumption, find out, right? Um, connect with people who are not like you, who work for you. And like, I think if enough people do that and take that seriously, right? Then an actual, you know, thriving, diverse work environment can start to grow at, at these companies. Great, thank you. Mark, do you wanna go next? Closing thoughts, call to action? Sure, sure. I, so, I mean, th this is a time when we just cannot allow our emotional activism off the hook. Um, and, and I wanna collaborate with, um, you know, and support other leaders uh, that want to make our playing fields more equal, especially, you know, for folks who, with returning citizens. So there are organizations that you can volunteer the, your services of your company for. Don't underestimate the value of volunteering the services of your business or giving credits to your from your company to a small business owner, entrepreneur. Um, you can find a bail fund to contribute to. Like I talk about that a lot, especially in the era of these protests. Um, you know, as I think about what's happening in Kenosha, um, you know, you, please, you can find a bail fund that you contribute to. And if you want to figure out ways to engage with FlickShop, I welcome that as well, always. Um, you can either become a flick shop angel, uh, which allows you to be able to support a child with an incarcerated parent, allowing this, the kid to be able to send as many selfies to mom and dad um, completely for free. Um, or you can schedule a moment of empathy uh, team event uh, that allows your entire team the ability to involve, get involved in, they can send anonymous notes to someone in a cell that needs a word of encouragement. Um, I'll put the, 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 the link to that in the, in the chat. It's flickshop.com and you can find out about the Flickshop Angels or the moment of empathy. Um, but I think that these are very tangible ways that you can engage on a personal level or you can in, in involve your team members that work. Great, great. Anil, you're next. You know, there's a couple of answers for this. I think, I think starting first with the community I'm part of, you know, for South Asian folks, we are overrepresented in tech. We have a disproportionate power you know, whether it's the CEOs of Google, Microsoft, Adobe, they're all, you know, Indian American men. And to understand one, that we have been complicit in the bias of the industry, that we have uh, a, a toxic poison of anti-blackness in our community, that we have been uh, part of reifying these unjust structures and that we have a culpability and responsibility to the communities that are the only reason we've been able to be here in the first place because the civil rights movement was led by people who would allow us to be here. I mean, I think that's something that we have not had enough discussions about. And you know, we, we talk about that a lot, but that's something to, to sort of center. And then moving out from the community that, you know, I come from, looking to the, the other communities we work with, I think within the tech industry to, um, to remind workers they have so much power. The people who are already in the industry um, are among the most powerful workers who've ever existed, right? And right now it gets channeled into like, they'll buy you a nice monitor for your desk and and you know, back when people were going into the office, you get nice snacks at work if you work at Google. That same power doesn't have to be going towards creature comforts just for you. It can go towards talking about you know, who do you do business with? What do you profit from? Who do you hire? Uh, and using that power, using that leverage. I, I think um, tech workers are just starting to seize that power. And I, I think it's great that they're doing that and, 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 and should be um, amplified, emphasized. For all of us as individuals, Think about, you know, to that point about what systems we're complicit in. What are the apps on your phone? Who made them? What are the business models of those apps, uh, those websites that you go to? And do you feel good about what they're doing with your money when you give it to them? That is a thing we have control over, 
right? And, and it's, it's the same as choosing what you buy, right? And you read the labels and you say, this is organic and I know which farm that apple came from and the name of the chicken that, you know, I ate, whatever. Like they get all that stuff, right? And, and if we look at that same level of expectation around the tech we use and just sort of say, is this yeah, locally grown, organic, healthy technology in my life made by people I trust or is it factory farmed exploitative tech? And, you know, it's not going to be a consumer movement alone that shifts things, but it absolutely can, especially because the people most affected by these harms are the people that set the tone and the culture and the business model for the biggest tech companies in the world. So I think that's something that each of us can sort of take action on. And then the last piece is um, it, it really is collective action. You know, I think it's people working together to support each other uh, and, and, and imagining that just like we can come together and provide each other with food when somebody in our community is in need, just like we can chip in on bail funds as we should all be doing all the time, just like we can do all these other pieces to support people that we can think of solving problems for each other with technology in that way, rather than let me go to the one big company and they are gonna tell me what the answer to our problem is, but to say maybe we will build technology together as a community that lifts us all up. Um, I still believe in that potential very deeply. Thank you, thank you. Phaedra, close this out. Uh, um, I, I wanna appreciate that all, because I think it's interesting. I don't think even the panelists, we've probably not done a good enough job of building each other. Mar I was just, Marcus and I were secretly chatting and I was like, how is this the first time that we've like spent time together, which is totally unacceptable. And if we were Stanford dudes, we would never have let that happen because we would have thought that the completely unacceptable. <laughs> and so, um, one thing I think is we as a group um, can better model what we think the world should look like. Like we aren't all figuring out, we all care about this issue, but we didn't get together and say like, how are our companies winning? How are we supporting each other? What does it look like when you win? Let me give you feedback on what I think sucks. Let me, you know, like that community of like thinking about growth, I think is really important. And so one is I think I'm gonna take my personal responsibility for doing that. The second thing is, I think we have to be kind to each other. And I'm sure that sounds like cuckoo in this moment, but I just think how hard it is to be a black or brown or person or trying to figure this stuff out right now. And, and I just think I was reading some of these questions about like, what do I do as someone who's been impacted by the justice system? How do I think about getting a job? Sister, I see you. I just want you to know, I know we didn't talk to you, but like, Part of it is just knowing that our folks are seen, heard, loved, cherished, and that even if we don't speak to each other, we are rooting for each other, trying to create opportunity for each other, and trying to build companies that do that for people. And so I feel like the best thing we can do is one is recognize there are better people coming behind us that when I see the amount of young people leading and boldly and pushing us, I feel inspired. I'm ready to move out of the way as soon as I can get this company in a place that I need to get it. So I think recognizing the brilliance that's behind us and then seeing and creating space for people who need space created for them and then making sure that we create opportunity to be people to be loving to themselves in a world that does not love them. And so that's my hope, I think, for this is that we do that because that's what I wish someone would have done for me is I think as a black woman, the amount of people who told me all of a critique of what I did, wherever, in every job I had, someone had a written critique of what I could have done better. And what I saw. It's like, my hope is I create a world where black women don't have to address that and that we create opportunity. And so I just, see, feel grateful to be here. And I hope we create a world where the fact that people still have to fight to get a job, like it's just, it's unacceptable and that people deserve better. And I think that's what we're all trying to create. Thank you so much. And I think from my end, um, just looking at, there are so many questions that I wish we can go through, um, but definitely for some of the folks who are uh, looking for opportunities to continue to skill up. Um, and as Phaedra said, we see you, I, I know who you're speaking about. Uh, I wanna put on your radar a, a, a collective called skillup.org. And there's about 20 plus different partners there that if you go and check them out, um, this is providing an opportunity for folks to get reskilled. So they're meeting you where you're at and there are a lot of different programs. These are free programs to continue to develop technical skills, digital skills uh, and so forth, as, as well as get connected to different opportunities. We know that we are in, an, in a situation right now, specifically economically, that we've never been in this, in this space before. And so I just wanna make sure that uh, folks are getting connected to those resources. 
as well as uh, acknowledging that there's an opportunity here um, to, to reimagine what those jobs are and the jobs of the future. And I think tech is going to continue to develop them. Um, and so I definitely encourage you all to continue to ask those questions. Um, and from my end at the Caper Center, we are currently doing uh, 100 days of action. And so there are a lot of different ways to get plugged in, a lot of different resources that we have. Please, please go to capercenter.org to learn more about that. Um, and I do think, especially from a policy perspective, we, we need to be holding these companies accountable. Uh, we need to be uh, having more of our community also uh, be in the public sector, be the ones that are, are also making the decisions as starting as like district district leaders or mayors and governors as well as uh, running for public office at the national level and and so i just want to encourage folks who are here uh listening um and then also making sure that we're going into november so just encouraging for the ones that can vote to vote um there's a lot of also support that needs to go towards helping some of the formerly incarcerated members get 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 those fines off their records so then that way they're also able to like, get their voting restored so i would encourage all of us to do that the deadlines for that vary by state and so um, get informed with whatever state you're in and support the organizations doing that work on the line uh, we need everybody's voice to be to be aligned um and and to fader's point it's an ecosystem and so we're here um, to be able to support each other as much as possible and thank you to justice through code for hosting this event for bringing it to all of us together and i know that there's uh, there's just so many rich questions that i hope we can um, address at, at some point um, or feel free to also share so that way we can we can address some of those folks so that way they we're we're seeing them and hearing them so with that said i'm going to pass it back thank you all so much for joining um and i'll pass it back to aiden Aiden and Antoine, I believe that's who's coming up next. Yeah. Hold on. I'm, I'm trying to get my video started. Sorry, it's not. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Thank you so much to everybody involved. And also to, to speak to what you were saying, Lily. Um, definitely, if anybody has questions that didn't get answered and they feel like they'd like to reach out to me, feel free to do so or contact us through um, our social media accounts. Um, we're also launching a five days of action items to follow up this event to highlight many of the topics we've explored today. Um, just as importantly, we're really calling on everyone in the audience today to engage the companies that they work with in committing to hiring formerly incarcerated people and Justice Through Code program graduates. For those of you wondering, about ways to build internal support for these initiatives, we encourage you to reach out to us. And finally, most importantly to me, for those of you in the audience who have also lived through the pain of incarceration and are interested in embarking on a career journey, we encourage you to continue to stay engaged with Justice Through Code, um, begin to explore taking free online courses through our educational partner, Coursera, also explore the resources that Lily mentioned um, I definitely thank you to everyone for taking the time to be a part of this impactful discussion, and especially to you, uh, John, Neil, Marcus, Phaedra, and Lily, for allowing us to hear your insights. I know this has been an incredibly moving discussion, and I feel very inspired um, moving forward. And finally, without the involvement of Professor Damon Phillips, Sandra Navalli, and everyone else at the Tamer Center, along with Professor Geraldine Downey and Claudia Rincon and everyone at the Center for Justice. None of this would, would have been passable. So we're truly grateful for your support. Thank you and have a good night.